will be recorded. Um, so if you will ask a question by unmuting yourself um, later in the webinar, um, you might be uh, audible later in the in the recording that we will put on YouTube. Uh, and we will share that recording with you as well. So you can rewatch the webinar or um, uh, shared uh, within your uh, groups. Um, sorry. Um, we will have a presentation of 25 minutes. Um, so roughly until um, 12 o'clock um, Central European time. And that gives us 30 minutes for a Q&A. So we'll have a lot of time for your questions. Um, you can ask the questions already um, during the webinar by using the question and answer, answer function. Um, and um, that will uh, allow us to already collect the question during the webinar. And you will also be able to um, vote up questions that you're particularly interested in, which helps us to find the ones that uh, where there's a lot of interest in the audience. Um, and now I'll hand over to Amandine for a very brief introduction to what we'll talk about today, and then we'll start hearing from our speakers. Thank you, Fabian, and welcome everyone to our webinar uh, on damages in uh, international investment arbitration. Um, so my name is Amandine Vandenberg. I work for Clan Earth, a global environmental law organization, and I work on uh, trade and investment issues and the nexus uh, with environment. Um, so today uh, we would like to discuss with you um, what makes uh, compensation in ISDS so dangerous. Uh, because we often discuss the regulatory chill factors of, uh, of ISDS. Um, so those factors that really reduce the policy space of governments, um, such as really the, the treaties, uh, substantive provisions that have led to far-reaching interpretation and inconsistent decision and unpredictable outcomes. Um, it's often also discussed uh, the impar impartiality uh, issues and the independence uh, issues of arbitrators uh, and the inherent, inherent uh, imbalance of the, of the system. But we um, often not really discuss another uh, factor of regulatory chill, which is the method of calculation and actually the amount of awards um, in ISDS cases, because in, in recent years, uh, we've seen a really um, a, a rise in the size of the damages that are awarded by ISDS tribunals, uh, really a dramatic uh, rise. And the size of, uh, of amounts is really a, a matter of concerns for uh, countries. Um, it's less discussed, uh, also, also, although um, that's um, clearly um, the perspective of having to pay billions of euros uh, with public money that uh, cause uh, governments to backtrack uh, or dilute their regulatory action. Um, and states have often really little uh, information as what to expect in terms of those damages um, that they may have to pay. And that's mainly linked to the fact that uh, investment treaties uh, are, I mean, they say really not little, uh, if nothing, on how to calculate those uh, damages. And so investment tribunal members have kind of taken that space to um, build how to calculate those compensation. Um, and so I'm really delighted today to welcome our two speakers who are going to um, deal with this topic and explain to us of those how those methods of calculation if, um, are um, being um, designed by uh, investment tribunals. Um, and to help us better understand this um, and this other dangerous element of ISDS. So I would like to welcome uh, Sarah Bruin, uh, who is a senior lawyer at uh, IISD, and Jonathan Bonicia, who is a lecturer at the faculty of the University of New South Wales and also an associate at IISD. And I will now hand out the floor to you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amandine, for that great introduction. Um, I think you really flagged a number of the, the key issues um, as part of this, this issue and this debate that we're going to be unpacking um, over the next 25 or so minutes. Um, I might just ask if we can get um, the slide deck pulled up. Um, and while that's happening, I'll just say thank you um, again to, to all of the organizers um, for putting together this event and for giving us an opportunity to discuss this really important and as Amandine said, a really neglected um, topic in international investment law. And it's one that 
Jonathan and I have been um, working on together for a little while now, and we, we put out a paper last year on compensation under international investment law that um, goes into a lot more detail on all of the issues that we're going to be discussing um, this morning. So if you have an interest in going a bit deeper on that, please um, have a look for that paper and perhaps we can share um, a link in the chat as well. Um, so if I could just have the next slide, please. Um, today, Jonathan and I are really going to be tackling these two kind of broad questions. The first is, um, what are the problems with compensation under international investment treaties? And then what are the compensation principles and the valuation techniques uh, that tribunals apply? And how did they get us here? How did they get us to um, these sort of seven large problems that we've identified? So I'll be tackling this first question and then and Jonathan will be coming in on the second question. Um, so over to the next slide, please. So to start with the first problem and perhaps the most obvious one and the one that Amandine flagged in her introduction um, is the fact that awards of compensation are large and they're increasing. So in the early 2000s, awards in the tens of millions of US dollars were considered to be very large. And now these types of awards almost seem quaint in retrospect because they've really been dwarfed by what we're increasingly seeing described to as mega awards. So today the largest known award is the total um, 50 billion um, awarded against Russia in a series of cases from 2014. Um, but there are also at least 50 known cases in which the tribunal has awarded more than 100 million US um, and 11 known cases in which the award has exceeded a billion US dollars. Um, and this is something that you see in this chart that we've got on the screen now, which um, shows the rolling 10 year average award. And we've actually excluded the UCOS cases from this chart because they um, are such an outlier that they have um, a really big spike that shows. Um, but you can see even excluding these claims, this, um, these awards have been steadily increasing, especially in the last 10 years. And the types of awards that we're seeing are large figures both in relative terms and in absolute terms. And there's two kind of important elements of this, um, of this relative part of the question. So firstly, they're relative to the size of award, awards 20 years ago, and that's what we're seeing here um, on the screen. Um, but they're also large relative to states' budgets for public spending. Um, I do apologize if you can hear a toddler screaming in the background, but there's not much I can do about that. Um, so they're large relative to, to the budgets, budgets that states have um, for public policy spending. And to take just one case as an example, um, in the Union Fenosa case, Egypt was ordered to pay 2 billion US plus interest. And at the time that was equal to 12% of Egypt's national budget for both health and education combined in the year 2018-19. And then awards like the 4 billion plus interest awarded against Pakistan in the Tetian Copper case, um, a, a case that's kind of notorious now and you'll hear us reference it um, throughout this presentation for various reasons. These types of awards are simply large in, in absolute terms. Um, so over to the next slide, please. The second problem that we've identified is that large awards are being made in regulatory disputes, even in a case where the investment continues to operate profitably. And to understand this and what, what we mean by this, we really need to go back to the roots of existing treaty provisions on compensation, which were developed um, in the decolonization era of the 60s and 70s. And back then, developed and developing countries disagreed um, on how much compensation should be paid in, the expro in cases of expropriation of foreign owned assets. Um, but one thing that they both agreed on, or one key assumption that underpinned this debate uh, that both sides agreed on was that investment disputes usually involved an outright seizure of a foreign owned asset by a host state. So here we're thinking, a government sent in the army and took over my hotel or my dam. So an outright seizure of a foreign owned asset. 
And it was with this type of dispute in mind that developed countries argued for compensation that equaled the fair market value of an expropriated asset or investment. And developing countries argued for a lower standard of compensation. Now, ultimately, uh, developed countries won this argument and they embedded the fair market value standard in the language of investment treaties, at least where compensation for expropriation was concerned. And John will get into a little bit more about how um, this the standard is applied. But so what's important to understand is that the development of the principles around compensation that are embedded in treaties, um, limited though they are, really were developed at a time when the notion of a treaty breach was rooted in this idea of an outright seizure of an asset. And now we're in a situation where most modern investor state disputes arise from regulatory interactions between a state and an investor. So these are cases where um, the investment is not seized outright, but rather it continues to be operated following um, a breach of an investment treaty by a state. So one example here is a series of arbitrations against Spain in response to the government's changes to tariffs for um, solar electricity generators. And um, John is going to, to go into a little bit more detail on one of these cases, but the outcomes of this series of cases are, are really inconsistent. And we see on one hand awards, um, really large awards of compensation for these types of regulatory breaches. Um, and on the other hand, we see cases in which the investors claims are dismissed um, outright. So um, in one of these cases, next year in Spain, the tribunal awarded um, 323 million US dollars in compensation um, on the basis that the investor was entitled to the above market rate of return that it would have gotten um, in the absence of the regulatory change. So we're seeing these kind of vast anomalies really because the principles of compensation that we find in investment treaties and the way they're applied um, really weren't designed with these types of regulatory disputes in mind. And so applying them then in a context of an investment that isn't seized, but that actually continues to operate, um, results in these types of anomalies. Um, over to the next slide, please. And here, um, you know, another problem that we come to is that, um, you know, it, it's really another of these stark anomalies that illustrates the fact that current compensation principles um, really aren't fit for purpose. And these are cases in which the difference between the amount actually invested by an investor and the amount that they get in compensation, um, this difference can be really vast. Um, and this is something that we're seeing where large awards are being made, um, where the state has been found to have interfered with a planned investment um, that was never actually built and never actually went ahead. Um, so again, to come back to the case of Tethyan Copper and Pakistan. In this case, um, the foreign investor was awarded 4 billion plus interest for Pakistan's failure to grant the necessary approvals to the investor to build and operate a mine, even though the mine was never actually built. In this case, the tribunal calculated compensation on the basis of its estimation of the income that that investment would have generated over its entire 50 year operating cycle as though it had been built. So just for scale and to go back to this point about uh, relatively large awards, um, this award is almost the same size as an IMF bailout of the Pakistani economy that had been decided or had been agreed just two months um, prior to this award. So that leads us kind of to the next problem and it raises this question of how do these types of enormous awards for investments that continue to operate profitably um, or investments that were never even built, how do they come about? Um, so if I can just have the next slide, please. And here perhaps, um, perhaps the most significant factor um, is really tribunals increasing willingness to base their awards on projections of an investment's expected future income across its entire life cycle. 
And here is where we see uh, investment tribunals really departing quite significantly from both accepted principles of international law and practices of other international courts and tribunals. Um, so this practice, um, this, this common valuation technique that you're going to hear a bit more about from Jonathan, um, it's known as the discounted cash flow or DCF method. And the use or the willingness to, to use this um, methodology, especially for early stage investments that don't have um, you know, a 20 years established track record of profitability. The use of this method departs from previously accepted principles of international law, as well as the World Bank's own guidelines on the valuation of foreign investment, which really warned against using DCF for these types of early stage investments. And also it departs from comparable practice of other international courts and tribunals. So to take um, one example here, the European Court of Human Rights is an example of another international legal regime, which similar to the investment treaty regime, allows for private actors to bring actions against states seeking monetary compensation for um, private property um, rights violations. But looking at compensation awards that the European Court of Human Rights uh, issues um, in these similar types of disputes shows that they're really taking an approach that results in much lower awards than what we see under investment treaties. So to bring back the UCOS case, the, the 50 billion um, award against Russia, in 2004, the UCOS shareholders brought a case against Russia to the European Court of Human Rights, as well as bringing um, claims at, um, under an investment treaty with essentially the same um, legal characteristics. And at the European Court of Human Rights, they were awarded $2.3 billion. And that remains the largest award of compensation that court ever made. So comparing that to the 50 billion, we really see um, the results of this difference in approach. Um, over to the next slide, please. So the use of a valuation technique like DCF isn't just a problem um, because it departs from these previously established principles of international law or what other courts um, are doing within the international system. The complexity of these valuation techniques and the jurisprudence on compensation in general, um, this is a problem in and of itself. And this is because it increases the costs of arbitration and that really disadvantages countries that don't have the in-house capacity or expertise to be engaging in detailed arguments about the intricacies of one valuation method over another. And here coming back to, to DCF, this method is really especially complicated. And Jonathan is going to unpack this bit for us, but essentially it, it relies on a complex set of interlocking forecasts and assumptions about the future of an investment stretching on into the future over the course of its lifespan. And investors almost always argue for the use of this method because it results in larger awards in most um, cases. And so investors will be um, relying on specialized financial consultancies very often to provide expert evidence to support their proposed valuations. Host states then have to retain their own financial experts to rebut this valuation evidence that the, that the investor is putting on. And so this complexity of the method and the need to use outside experts and engage in this sort of war of, of experts, um, it really drives up the costs of litigation. And so here, um, to bring back Tethian Copper, in the compensation phase alone, so the, the quantum phase alone, the investor spent 4.5 million US dollars on experts and another 17.5 on financial experts, another 17.5 million US dollars on legal fees just for the compensation phase. Pakistan spent almost 10 million US dollars defending the compensation phase, including financial and legal experts. So here, just to remember, there's already been a merits phase in which Pakistan has been found in breach. This is just the quantum phase determining the amount of compensation. So this is just really to illustrate what we mean by the costs are really being driven up and up and up for states to defend the use of these really complex valuation techniques. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna try and go a little bit quicker because I've just seen the time. So um, one of the problems that we see is that the approach um, to when these types of evaluation techniques uh, are appropriate is really inconsistent. And so um, tribunals take different approaches to when it's appropriate to use methods like DCF, what type of evidence is needed to back it up, what quality of evidence, and then how to account for risks um, to an investment's projected income stream ac across its life cycle. And we can see differences in hundreds of millions of dollars um, in the choice of one approach over the other. And the really good example of that is in um, Bear Creek in Peru, um, where the investor argued for the use of DCF um, and claimed it was entitled to 500 million US dollars. The tribunal rejected the use of DCF because it was an early stage investment with no track record of profitability and instead awarded uh, sunk costs essentially of 18 million. Compare that again to Pakistan where DCF was accepted and resulted in this enormous award. So the, the choice of one technique over the other is, it's complex and technical, but it's very, very important to the, the bill that the state will have to, to foot at the end. And then just to come to the next slide and the last of these problems before I hand over to Jonathan. Um, the problem here is that tribunals in arriving at their awards are not taking in to account important contextual factors. So there's a few different types of important contextual factors, but just to choose one for the sake of time. Um, and one quite obvious one is, is the strength of the public interest rationale, which would justify the state's uh, interaction or interference rather with the investment. So a case that I imagine a lot of people um, listening are aware of is a German investor currently um, suing the Netherlands under an investment treaty um, for its decision to shut down all coal power plants by 2030 as part of its clean energy transition. If the tribunal in that case rules um, that the Netherlands is in breach, this public interest justification is not at all relevant in the determination of compensation. It, it simply isn't a question. So um, that's just one of three different types of contextual factors we've identified that would be really important to have a more holistic approach to compensation. Um, I won't go into the other two um, for lack of time. And I will now just hand over um, to Jonathan to take us through what are the compensation and valuation techniques that tribunals apply that led us to this, um, this set of problems. Um, thanks so much, Sarah. And if we could have the next slide, please. Um, so as Sarah said, we're <clears throat> shifting to the second part of the presentation and a slightly more technical discussion of um, the content of investment treaties, the provisions that relate to compensation and um, how they've been interpreted and applied, including through the use of different valuation techniques. Um, and I'll move uh, through this quite quickly, um, but I'm very happy to sort of speak to it in more detail and questions if people are interested in, in this. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please. Um, what do investment treaties actually say about compensation or, or damages? Um, so as Sarah foreshadowed, um, investment treaties do say something about the amount of compensation that should be provided uh, for the expropriation of a foreign investment. And as we heard, this is, this is a principle that emerged from a historical debate. Um, and the principle contained in investment treaties is, is the view that developed countries articulated uh, that compensation for an expropriated investment um, should equal the fair market value of that investment. Um, there's some slight differences in, in text, in language between treaties, um, but they're, they're very, very similar. Um, and tribunals have generally glossed over any um, difference. Um, and so uh, fair market values sometimes specified um, as referring to the price that a willing buyer would pay a willing seller for that investment. Um, but as we'll see, uh, the question of how to determine that amount uh, remains uh, unspecified normally in investment treaties. Um, but the even bigger gap is in relation to all the other 
uh, provisions in investment treaties. Um, so if you've attended any uh, of these seminars about uh, investment treaties, you've probably heard something about the fair and equitable treatment provisions uh, contained in these treaties, um, quite notorious. Uh, that's the provision that investors most commonly uh, use to base a claim against a host state um, and also the uh, provision um, with which foreign investors have the best rate of success in arbitration. Um, but the treaties don't say anything about the amount of compensation or damages um, that should be pays, paid if a host state violates uh, this requirement to treat a foreign investment fairly and equitably, or indeed um, any of the other provisions. So there's just nothing there in the treaties um, outside the expropriation context. Um, and to plug that hole, um, tribunals have reached for a very abstract principle in, in um, international law um, that damages should wipe out all the consequences of the breach of the treaty. So, so that's this idea that you calculate damages on the basis to put the investor in the position they would have been in, but for uh, the breach of the treaty. Um, that's a provision um, that was developed actually in a different context in international law. Um, and there's some uncertainty about the detail of its application, but that's, that's the way um, tribunals have consistently uh, interpreted investment treaties. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, an initial sort of thought that many of you might have on, on um, seeing that is whether, you know, the question, is there really any difference between these principles? Um, and the answer generally is no. Um, we say a bit more about this in the paper. There might be some situations where they could differ. Um, but in the hands of investment treaty tribunals, if we're just trying to understand the current practice on its own terms and the problems with the current practice on its own terms, uh, we can see that tribunals generally treat these principles as interchangeable um, and nothing really turns on that. Um, and that sort of stems from this view that, well, you know, imagine in a case of expropriation, what has the investor lost? they've lost the value of the investment. Um, so you, one way to approach that is to say, well, what is the fair market value of the investment? And another way to approach that is to say, well, if we were to put the investor in the position it would be in, but for the breach of the treaty, that would involve compensation equivalent to the market value of the investment. So that's how, um, that's how that normally washes out. So we have this situation um, where uh, there's very little um, text in the treaties, but tribunals have ge generated uh, this practice um, around compensation. And before I um, dive more deeply into explaining that practice, if I could just add the next slide, um, I want to um, just jump in on the question of whether there's been any any recent um, developments or reforms um because it's um quite important i think to to flag um text that is found uh for example in the netherlands the new netherlands model bilateral investment treaty and also um in the canada eu agreement investment chapter um where there is a little bit more uh, specification around compensation. So um, in those treaties, uh, there is language saying that monetary damages shall not be greater than the loss suffered by the investor. If you just read that in uh, isolation from everything else, that might sound like sort of limiting language or some sort of reform. Um, but it's really important to understand that that language is just a restatement of the existing approach. So existing tribunals would say that all they're doing is compensating the investor for what the investor has lost. Um, they just take a particular view of how that loss ought to be assessed. And that, that's the view that um, the loss that needs to be assessed 
is the amount the investor lost compared to what they would have earned if the state hadn't breached the investment treaty. So this, this language um, in some recent European treaties, to be clear, is not, um, is not reform language that's almost, um, would almost certainly be interpreted just as a restatement of the uh, existing approach. So let's um, go to the next slide and finally, um, look a bit more closely at valuation methods, um, which has been something that's sort of been hanging over us up till now. So investment treaties don't specify um, how fair market value should be ascertained. Um, and as we've seen, they don't even say what the amount of compensation or damages should be for other breaches of the treaty at all, let alone specifying how that amount should be ascertained. Um, so this is a field of practice that has been developed by arbitral tribunals in ISDS approaches. And there are basically three types of approaches. Um, so the first one is uh, called market-based approaches. Um, and this um, is probably quite intuitive. Uh, if you're thinking about say you own a car and what is the market value of the car or you own an apartment, you're thinking about selling it, what is the market value of your apartment? So a market-based approach would just be to look at um, similar transactions for buying and selling of cars like your car um, and, and to estimate the market value of your car based on the prices um, at which similar cars are being brought, bought and sold. Um, but in um, investment treaty arbitration, that's almost impossible um, most of the time because there are very uh, rarely comparable assets that are being traded that you could um, look at. So second type of approach um, is an asset-based approach. And this is normally uh, the most conservative approach, not always, um, but normally. And that would be to say, well, if we wanted to ascertain the, the fair market value of an investment or to work out what has the investor lost um, as a result uh, of the host stage breach of the treaty, we'd look to the amount the investor actually spent. So the cost of the assets, um, perhaps adjusted for some sort of depreciation or inflation. Um, so that would be an asset-based approach. And the third category of approach, um, which is becoming um, increasingly popular and I think is driving um, most, uh, not all, but most of, of, of the real expansion in compensation under investment treaties is, is the income-based approach to valuation. Um, so according to that approach, the idea is that you value an investment based on what its income generating potential is. Or another way to phrase that is to say, well, if you're trying to work out uh, what has an investor lost as a result of the host state's breach of the investment treaty? What the investor has lost is they have lost the income generating potential of their asset. So if we want to put them in the position they would be in, but for the breach of the treaty, uh, we need to uh, restore to them the income that they would have generated if they continued to have the benefit of this investment. Um, and as we heard from Sarah, um, discounted uh, cash flow is by far the most um, common um, approach to income-based valuation. And on the next slide, if I can have it, I've got an example of that um, in a case we already mentioned several times, Tethin Copper uh, against Pakistan. Um, and so if you, if you want to read through this case, I mean, the, the, the um, decision on compensation is about 600 pages long. Even then, there's still a lot that's actually hidden away in the assumptions. But basically, you can get a sense of how this process works out. So uh, the tribunal has to estimate for every year um, for the investors projected operating cycle. So I think that was almost 60 years into the future what the investment's revenue would have been and what its costs would have been. To do that, it needs to estimate the quantity of copper and gold uh, that the mine would have produced, the likely uh, price of those metals 
projected 60 years into the future, uh, all the costs associated with operating a mine that doesn't exist, uh, all the risks that might have faced a mine adjacent uh, to a war zone um, that doesn't actually exist. Um, and they have to make a whole bunch of assumptions about the regulatory arrangements um, that would have been reached uh, to govern that mine that doesn't exist. And then you can plug this all into a model and it will spit out a number. Um, and even um, at this length of 600 pages, very difficult to understand what actually drives this valuation. So um, what assumptions are doing what work in the valuation model and to what extent even apparently quite small changes in the assumptions compounded every year over 60 years into the future would have potentially had radically um, different effects on the outcome. Um, and this question of the assumptions, if we can go to the next slide, is, is something I really want to pinpoint in a energy charter treaty arbitration arising out of um, Spain's changes to the tariff structure governing solar investment. So Spain had established a very, very generous um, solar uh, regime to attract foreign investment. Um, as many of you probably know, um, the, the cost of solar investment um, or establishing solar facilities rapidly decreased over the last 15 years. A lot of investment piled in. Um, the regime was unsustainable. The European Union got involved. Um, and so Spain changed the tariff regime. Uh, so it was uh, somewhat less generous to the foreign investor. Um, the tribunal found that was a breach of the investment treaty and they calculated compensation using this DCF model. Um, and, and the compensation is calculated based on the investor's loss compared to a situation in which um, this, a hypothetical situation in which this extraordinarily generous tariff regime would have re remained unchanged. Um, so this is sort of hugely problematic in that case, um, but it's even more problematic if we start thinking about the same structure of disputes um, in fossil fuel phase out contexts where the investor might be arguing and might be able to cite quite strong um, precedence within the ISDS system to say, well, um, compensation here needs to be calculated based on my projected future income against a hypothetical scenario in which nothing changed and we were able to continue on the same basis of pollution that we were polluting, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, so now to my final slide. Um, and it's just to pose a question about, well, what does this all mean? Um, so at one level, this is just about understanding the system better. So um, even if you think investment treaties should be scrapped entirely, and I think there's, you know, there's, a, there's a strong case for that, um, understanding how compensation is currently operating is a key part of understanding that system. So we need to understand the principles um, that determine when a state will be held liable for the breaching fair and equitable treatment provisions, but also to understand how much is actually at stake in, in those disputes. Um, the discussion of compensation is also relevant if we were, and I'm deliberately leaving this question open, um, to decide that investment treaties do have some role into the future. Um, because um, I think really on any view, the um, current approach to compensation is deeply problematic for the reasons Sarah's explained. Um, and although we won't speak to this now, we're happy to answer questions on it. Um, in some of the IISD publications, um, we set out some principles that if uh, states were to reconsider the approach to compensation and decide they wanted to remain in the investment treaty system, how they should start uh, to think about um, restructuring that from the ground up. So thanks very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Sarah and Jonathan. That was an extremely interesting and rich uh, presentation. So um, yeah, I think it, it created a lot of uh, questions already that we can see in the in the Q and A. And I will, uh, Amandine and I will will start going through them um, uh, one by one. And maybe you can just pick who of you wants wants to answer them. Um, so a first question came in about the consultants or experts that are um, in these cases uh, assessing the the damages. Um, if you can say anything about who they are, uh, whether that's an industry on its own, and what interests do they have um, in in these cases and in the sums that are. Um, uh, uh, negotiated there and do you think they played an impact on the in the development of of damages there was also a, a request um, maybe to jonathan that um sometimes the audio is breaking off um if you wanted to turn off your camera and we can see if if that works better um so yeah one of you um can can start with that one should i um take the point about the experts, Sarah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really important point um, because um, like many other areas of ISDS, there is this sort of problem of multiple hatting. Um, and in fact, um, perhaps the most sort of outrageous example, and we talk about this in the paper, um, is um, something that was highlighted in a case um, involving Pfizer um, and Spain, um, where an arbitrator and a uh, damages consultant were uh, working together um, on another dispute um, where the arbitrator was acting as the investor's lawyer with the damages consultant at the same time as a parallel dispute where the lawyer was acting as an arbitrator hearing the evidence of the same damages consultant. And in fact, they had, I think, worked together on um, more than six or seven cases in the past in various configurations. So you get this very, um, this problem of multiple hatting and, 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 sort of repeat interactions um, between the damages consultants and many of the sort of key lawyers in the city, in the in the system who operate you know both as arbitrators um, and as 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 counsel so it's a real issue Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we have another question, very interesting question on the weather. Um, and what solutions actually states have uh, after an, um, an award uh, has been rendered to avoid paying actually the, the full amount? Is there any principles actually states can bring forward domestic courts uh, when they intervene, for, for example, through an appeal or at the enforcement stage? Um, for example, using the argument that it would go against public order or it deprived the state from uh, too much from its budget. Um, so if one of you can take up that question, that would be very interesting. Yeah, perhaps I can um, tackle that one first and quite succinctly. And then if Jonathan wants to come in, I mean, I think within the actual ISDS system itself, there are very few or sort of very narrow grounds um, on which a state can seek to annul an award. Um, and I won't go into those legal grounds now, but just to say they are um, very narrow and they're really focused on errors of sort of manifest or significant errors of law. Um, and so they wouldn't provide this type of um, relief that the, the question is sort of um, suggesting around um, public policy uh, elements or around ability um, of the state to actually pay the award. So I guess the short answer is no, there's not really a, a satisfactory um, process to, um, to dispute an award on those grounds. John, I don't know if you had something you wanted to add there. Um, I, well, I completely agree. I mean, there was a, a more detailed discussion on this point um, at the Columbia S Center for Sustainable Investment event last week um, with uh, Martins Paprinskis um, discussion about crippling compensation. 
Um, but the short answer, as Sarah says, is that these arguments have occasionally been made in annulment um, proceedings or as a grounds to resist enforcement. But um, so far as I know, they've never uh, been successful. So now the upvoting uh, function is also working. So you can indicate which questions you're particularly interested in. Sorry that we didn't activate that before. One that um, gets a lot of interest is the question whether third party funding plays any role in increasing the amounts of compensation that are being awarded. Um, sure, I can have a, a quick go at that one. Um, I think, so I, I guess as a kind of, um, well, the simple answer from my perspective would be yes. Um, I think there's probably a, a lot of room for a, a bit more detailed study on exactly how that um, that force is, is driving um, claims up. But I think really linked to Jonathan's um, answer to the first question about experts, um, you have this kind of additional party now that's sort of joining this ecosystem in which there are now, um, you know, quite a lot of parties except for states. So you have the specialized financial consultancies, you have um, arbitrators who typically act um, for investors, you have um, lawyers for claimants and you have third party funders, all of whom share this interest in driving up the size of awards and especially third party funders where you know, they are literally invested in a large award because that is where they get paid. And so I think, um, yes, I would say that by virtue of having an additional um, party in the system that shares this interest and also an additional um, avenue for conflict um, because third party funders have advisors who advise them on which claims um, to invest in and, and also they advise typically on strategy. Um, there's now another element for, you know, double, triple, quadruple housing. So it, it's a part of the system that I think is certainly driving, um, certainly driving the size of awards. Thanks very Jonathan, much. I don't know if you had. To... Okay, sorry. No, go ahead, Jonathan. If you want to add anything. Yeah, that was great. Okay, thank you both. Um, we have another question, um, whether uh, you would have any suggestion on how that problem uh, could be addressed, but without needing to change actually the, the treaty texts. Why don't I have a first crack at that? Um, because um, I think it would be very difficult, frankly, um, and potentially counterproductive to, to sort of focus efforts on something that's unlikely to be effective. Um, you know, there, there is a possibility of states getting together to make joint interpretive statements about the, the treaties um, because there is no explicit text on the calculation of damages outside the expropriation context. If you had states collectively, for example, all the states that are party to the Energy Charter Treaty uh, together to make a, a statement about what they think the principle should be covering uh, governing compensation for breach of the treaty, then then that might be um, effective. Um, but the honest truth is that if you can get the political will to get a statement like that together, um, it's not obvious to me why you wouldn't just change or terminate the treaty. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think I, I want to come in on this because I think it's a really important point and an important question and one that we obviously haven't really gotten into in terms of reform options. But, um, you know, something that we really, as ISD and in our role, kind of working directly with developing country governments, um, what we're trying to do around this issue is really um, get states to take ownership of this issue and to understand that part of why we are where we are is because as, as we made the point in our presentation, there is this real gap when it comes to treaty language on what compensation principles should be um, for any breach other than expropriation. And so to kind of drive this point that states are the masters of their treaties and if they don't like the way things are done, they need to come up with treaty language that will better constrain tribunals in how they approach compensation evaluation. That is really a message that we're trying to drive here. 
And I think to Jono's point about a, a joint interpretation, um, you know, these instruments tend to be quite narrowly interpreted and they tend to be seen as something that is about clarifying text existing in a treaty. And so we have essentially an absence of text and that's what you're trying to address. I don't know that um, that a tribunal would consider itself to be bound by that type of joint interpretation. So our message really is um, treaty language is, is what is needed here. I see there's quite a bit of interest in a little bit wider and more general questions on, on ISDS and, and how to deal with ISDS. For now, I would think we stick a little bit more to to the presentation and what we what we discussed so far, and then we see at the end if there's time for for opening up those those general questions as well. Um, there is uh, one question on uh, what argument states have used against the use of DCF for valuation. Um, maybe one of you can say something about that. Yeah, sure, why don't I start and Sarah can also uh, jump in. Um, so, I mean, states have used a, used a range of arguments. They've argued that um, the investment has um, no track record of profitable operation. So any sort of, you know, supposed projection about its likely future income stream is completely speculative. Um, they've um, argued that um, DCF valuations are inconsistent with the actual amounts that the investor in question has paid for the investment. That was a, that was a real issue in the Tethia and Copper case that we mentioned because um, in that case, the, the investor that made the, the treaty claim and got the sort of multi-billion dollar damage award had actually purchased the investment a couple of years earlier um, from another mining company for a, a couple of hundred million dollars, I think. And so that transaction and the value at which that transaction occurred was completely inconsistent um, with, with the idea that this investment was really worth billions of dollars. Um, states have made lots of arguments as well about um, the, the problems internal to the way that um, the DCF model is being operationalized in a particular case. So that I, I'm trying to collect a couple of questions here. So I saw a couple of questions were about this issue of, well, surely um, everyone, even a, even a commercial investor would expect legislation to change. They would know the regulatory environment's going to change and that needs to be reflected in the valuation. Well, I mean, I would have thought so too, um, but this is one of the real kind of problems with some of the tribunal practice is that some extraordinarily favorable assumptions to the investor get hidden in the modeling, including assumptions that, you know, there won't be any unforeseen risks and all sorts of beneficial arrangements will continue indefinitely without any change. So, so states have made all, all these arguments, um, but, but the, the problem is in part um, that the whole, the whole system is sort of geared towards um, investors um, because they're the only actor that can bring, bring a claim under the system. Um, and also that the investor has a whole bunch of tactical advantages uh, over a state, for example, the, the state's just not going to be in the same position to uh, bring forward evidence about the amount of money the investor would have earned 50 years in the future. Only the investor themselves will be able to sort of generate a set of cash flow predictions in the future. A state just can't do it. So there's all sorts of tactical issues as well down the needs that are causing problems here. Thanks very much. There is another uh, remark and, and question also um, on actually that how also, I mean, Sarah, you mentioned it that um, it's clear that um, the, the external factors are not considered um, at the, when they are deciding on the compensation. But the question is actually 
how uh, can expected future profits uh, be evaluated in such a vacuum, actually? Because investors themselves, uh, necess- I mean, they have to uh, take regulatory and market uh, environment into account when they are making their business plans and, and projection. And so um, the question is really, yeah, how, how does that, uh, I mean, why, why is this? If you can pr- perhaps uh, give some insight on this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think the question itself kind of points to the problem with this um, approach. And and I think Jono kind of raised this as well in his illustration of how this was done in, in Tethy and Coppa. The tribunal is, is trying to predict the future in so many different ways, and it's trying to predict um, future agreements on applicable tax rates, and it's trying to come up with a percentage and apply that to um, the political risk and the sort of geopolitical factors at play in the particular investment. And so it's it's really trying to get out a crystal ball um, to predict your future and then to, you know, put a number on that. And so I think that the question of how can they do this is is the question of what is wrong with this um, this process, I would say, or this, this methodology. Um, yeah, that would be my response. I don't know if, don't know if you have more sort of a technical response to that, but that's kind of my um, reaction to that question. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Could I just come in? Sorry to, uh, I can see that we're really almost at time. And there was a question that popped up that I wanted to um, respond to about which states are taking the lead in trying to get this issue on the agenda. Um, I think it's an interesting question and an important one. And um, two things to say. One is that, um, Although, as we said, there are very few innovations in this space in treaty language on compensation, the few in- innovations that we do see um, are coming out of the African continent and coming out of the regional economic um, community and their investment um, um, their investment protocols and um, agreements. And so we see some interesting um, language around compensation for expropriation coming out of the um, Southern African development communities model bit, um, the Comesa investment agreement, um, the African Union's Pan-African Investment Code, which is likely to be the starting point of the AFCFTA investment protocol. So there's those kind of reform elements coming from the continent. We don't think they're kind of enough, as we say in the paper, but it's one thing that's being done. And then in terms of getting compensation onto the agenda at UNCTRA Working Group 3, which is the current um, Um, process ongoing at the international level to consider procedural reforms to ISDS. Um, It was Pakistan and Nigeria that were the two countries who really pushed the UNSATRA Secretariat to accept, um, to consider the issue of compensation in, um, as part of the kind of cross-cutting issues section of the agenda. Um, Unfortunately, it hasn't appeared on an agenda since then, that was in 2019. Um, But it's something that, um, just to name another state, the um, South African government also mentioned in their um, in their submit in their written submission to the working group, and they requested a kind of instrument to guide tribunals on how they approach compensation. So I think those are just a few states that are kind of leading in this regard. Okay, I see we're. uh... At the end of our time now, there are still a few questions and um, we're sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but I think it just uh, speaks to the thinking and the um, interest that your presentation has uh, generated, um, that that there are so many questions and so much engagement. Um, We really wanted to thank both of you for taking the time to present the issue to us today. I think it was incredibly interesting and uh, helpful. Um, As I said before, we will share the presentation and the recording of this webinar, uh, and we will link to the publication that was mentioned several times now, where I think you can find a lot more uh, details on the questions that we discussed in the webinar. Um, So thank you both very much. You're very welcome to, for some final remarks, if you also want to say anything about the wider ISDS questions, which went beyond the scope of this uh, webinar. Yeah, probably I won't come in on these questions as I'm, I'm sure people have um, other engagements, but I just wanted to say thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to present on this issue. I think it's one that we're both 
um, really passionate about and we're very pleased to see um, more interest being taken um, in the topic. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, then, bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.